Yes, I am. Yes, yes, I am ready. Oh, it's already recording. Okay. So right. I, I assume the grimace was actually just you saying yes. I didn't think you were going to say yes. <laughs> Welcome to Caleb Can't Read. I'm Jordan Rabel. I'm Caleb Terrence. I'm proud of you. Shush. <laughs> I'm happy you're here. I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to be here. The sun is out. <laughs> the sun is out. The guns are out. Nice. Yeah. Nice transition, bud. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Never Sober podcast. <laughs> uh, no, we had we had a sober episode with Sean. We had a sober. The the Marquis de Sade was a sober topic. Was it? Yeah, we chose the one with the oh, scat right. fetishes you know to not drink. <laughs> That's yeah. right. I think because we tried recording it on our own before we needed somebody else in. Because oh we like, my god, yeah. And we're just like, maybe our issue was that we kept drinking every time something bad happened to cut the awkwardness and. It was very hard. Yeah. Now that I think about it, that that's really bad that like I was too uncomfortable joking around about it with you. But if Sean was there and I could make him uncomfortable, <laughs> then for some reason I felt better. Sean's just uh, just seems like a like he's got a very virgin mind for us. Uh, like in, in terms of this podcast of the fucked up shit that we may be hearing. No, about. he's probably just wise enough to realize he shouldn't be associated <laughs> with anyone who speaks about <laughs> what we speak about. about the whippings or the <laughs> I just like, you guys brought me on for this fucking episode <laughs> like and you both knew welcome sean your name is on the internet <laughs> <laughs> well this um this episode that we have uh today is actually a, gonna be a it's a it's a topical What's episode. It, uh, gonna, uh, 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 it's not an author it's actually not an author we have rules man um, I'm breaking them for as many times as you've broken the rules with, I have, with what no pre gaming. What fucking okay. no pre gaming? Oh well, that's you know. That's, I'm just taking one. That's a bendable to not do an author. That's a bendable rule. We're talking about authors in this uh, episode, though it will happen. It shall occur. Are they but, dead? Uh, actually, no. So <laughs> that's two rules, Jordan. <laughs> I've never broken two. I'm once. sorry. I've got like nine others that I'm allowed to break too. So you know what? Pants are coming off. Shirts coming off. Other rules are made to be broken. Okay. I'm just bending them though because I've got speedos on under this. Mm, keep bending it. <laughs> yeah, this is a uh, this is going to be a topical episode. I did this research in the course of a week since this uh, event happened uh, in America um, just last week, and. Um, it, it it rustled Jimmy's for me, so I'm yeah. I'm just yeah. Well, let's get started, shall we? Fucking please. The earliest mention we have of book burnings comes sometime in the early 600s BC from the Tanakh, often regarded as the Hebrew Bible. In it is the Book of Jeremiah, where the king Yahokim disapproves of Jeremiah's praiseworthy words about God. Yahokim reads the scroll smirks and says, hm, I am still king. He then scribbles out every mention of the word God, casts the remains of Jeremiah's scroll into the fire. Quote, and it came to pass that when Yahukim had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. End quote. <clears throat> now, because the story is so old, there are pieces of it that are missing particularly the ending. But the one thing that all scholars agree on is that it ends with the king, Yahukim, dying in some horrible manner. The most accepted method was that he was cut into pieces, fed to dogs, and in his skull were carved the words, this and one more. It is also said that the people tried to bury the skull, but each time they did, it would be uncovered by the winds and forced from the ground, as if the earth itself refused his bones. Fucking sick. Uh, fucking metal. <laughs> I can't. Uh, I can't imagine how fucking terrified I would be though to just pick up like not just a human skull and be like, oh neat, this is going in the library. But like to see fucking words carved into it, this and one more. I'm like, oh, is it me? Like, <laughs> neat. Put it in the ground. <laughs> uh oh. Fuck. Put it back in the ground. <laughs> Jesus. Why? Christ. Why? <laughs> fucking god damn it. All right. <laughs> like, it keeps spitting it out like it's the fucking Necronomicon. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> Now, the history of book burning is very long and unfortunately has never really stopped. But today I will give you some of the more memorable book burnings from history. 
We have political burnings, religious burnings, and yes, of course, hillbilly burnings. Hillbilly burnings. Hillbilly burnings. What's that? Like that's like, our most recent one, and we'll get to it. Like for warmth or? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Just uh, out of fear of magic in the year 2022. Magic is scary. <laughs> It doesn't have to be. Hey, if you truly believed in magic, it would be scary, wouldn't it? I mean, that doesn't make you not a fucking idiot. I'm just saying, like, I understand. I don't <laughs> like, know. If you're a grown-ass man believing in magic and it's like, it all that it is is unexplained ah! things. I'm not talking about, like, sorry. <laughs> I'm not talking about, like, unexplainable. Like, you know, there's, like, the left-hand and right-hand path of magic where you're just kind of, like, tricking yourself psychologically into believing certain things are happening. That's a form of magic, but it's kind of like a vision board. If you really believe, like, uh oh, the winds are sure are feisty today. I better kill this toad. Like, I don't know, that might make you a fucking idiot. <laughs> I mean, I mean, how big of a step is that away from, like, you know, I... <laughs> Look, we do Groundhog Day because it's cute. We don't actually believe that it's predicting the weather. That's all I'm saying. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I totally knew about Groundhog Day, actually. So, uh, yeah, move the on, movie? please. Don't linger here. <clears throat> well, <laughs> all of these burnings that uh, these groups may give you, or all the reasons why they do these burnings, why they do what they do, it all boils down to the exact same reason. It is purely for the suppression of knowledge, and in most cases, little more than a gimmick. How does it usually <clears throat> work out? Well, let me tell you. Okay. We'll start with one of the most famous and earliest book burnings in history, beginning in China in the year 213 BC. Ah, I know where this is going. Ah. Yeah. (laughs) A chancellor to the emperor, Qin Shi Huang, a man named... Don't look at me that way. Is that your A game? Uh Huh? Is that your A game on that pronunciation? It starts with a Q. (laughs) How hard did you try? Oh, I'm not going to start going into what I think is an Asian okay, dialect. Okay, right, 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 right. <laughs> so a chancellor to the emperor, a man named Li Si, suggested that the best way to keep one's position of power is to destroy the things that keep people educated and intellectually free. In other words, the best way to keep people from knowing that you're doing something wrong is to not allow them to know any other way but yours. As Li Si told the emperor, quote, I, your servant, propose that all historians' records other than those of Emperor Kins be burned. With the exception of the academics whose duty uh, includes possessing books, if anyone under heaven has copies of the Shi Jing, which was a book of classical poetry, the Shu Jin, which was a book of classical history, or the writings of the hundred schools of philosophy, they shall deliver them, the books, to the governor or the commandant for burning. Anyone who dares to discuss the Shi Jing or Shu Jing shall be publicly executed. Anyone who uses history to criticize the present shall have his family executed. Any official who sees the violations but fails to report them is equally guilty. Anyone who has failed to burn the books after 30 days of this announcement shall be subjected to tattooing and be sent to build the Great Wall. Did, did tattooing mean something different? Or? No, they were still getting tattooed. I just, I don't know what they like tattooed on Like a sick fucking them. tattoo or like a... <laughs> No, they just gave him a fucking Sailor Jerry's tat, like... <laughs> get a sick tattoo and an awesome construction Actually, job. Sailor like... Jerry's fine, but, uh, yeah, Ed Hardy tattoo, probably. Hmm. Oh, you know what they gave him? Shamrocks. <laughs> is it muggy in here? It is muggy in here. Open that window up. Go, do it. Hang on. All right. All right. But you see, there were exceptions. As Lisi went on, he said, quote... The books that have exemption are those on medicine, divination, agriculture, and forestry. Those who have interest in laws shall instead study from officials. So basically, he was totally fine with books that have to deal with things like medicine or any other kind of trade. You just, you couldn't subject yourself to art because art makes people think. And if they start thinking, that's when things get dangerous. And you couldn't read about past emperors because then you had something to compare emperor kin to. That's why they got rid of the history. But apparently, as famous as this whole ordeal was, it was closer to infamy in the request itself than in the real-life result. As it turned out, the banned books were owned by a lot of royals who were quick to complain and were given exceptions to the rule. Also, the banned books were part of the imperial library and were not to be removed under orders of Emperor Qin Shi Huang himself. So even under the threat of death, the peasants who this rule was actually for saw that there were a lot of exceptions, so they just kind of told Lee C. to go fuck himself, and not a whole lot happened. There were some book burnings, yes, but not a whole lot. 
the books that were uh, that were actually like really targeted for burning ended up being the uh, the books on history in a poor attempt to act as if the Kin dynasty was the first dynasty and were always there from the beginning. And you know what? That might have worked if China had closed borders from uh, from the very beginning. Um, Doing all right, bud. Uh, yeah. You need a second. You need a little pause. No, I'm break. all right. Get out of your system. <laughs> if they had um, if they had closed borders like Japan did. Other parts of the world wouldn't have like known much of their history, but other parts of the world knew who came before the Qin Dynasty and had plenty of their own books on the subject too. So unfortunately, those outside books, though they they weren't very extensive on Chinese history, so we did come away with limited knowledge on who ruled before them anyway. So in a way, I guess it kind of worked. There were also rumors that Emperor Qin Shi Huang went a step further than the uh, book burning about a year later and started targeting scholars. Specifically, it is said that he buried 460 scholars alive in his purge against learning. But although this is seen as a fact, there's no actual proof that this ever happened. It's probably less, but... I, I mean, do you think he ever really did? I don't know, probably. Uh, especially burying somebody alive. Like, why are you being particularly cruel about it? Ah, it's because it's going to make it a cool legend. You know, like, <laughs> why not just, like, I don't know. I'm not a freak out for first. funsies. <laughs> To teach other people, like, this is what you get when you read books. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's what happened to you, I believe. I mean, oh, oh dear. <laughs> oh, recovered memories. Oh, no. <laughs> now, the reason book burning gains traction every decade or so is because the people who are doing the burning don't see it as a suppression of knowledge, but rather a suppression of evil. It's even treated directly as such in the Bible, which claims that St. Paul in the year 55 AD gathered a crowd of people in the town of Ephesus and convinced them to burn their books of magic in favor of miracles handed down by God. According to St. Paul, so many people had gathered to burn their magical scrolls that had the works survived, they'd be worth, quote, 50,000 pieces of silver. And no, I don't have an estimate to how much that'd be worth today. Uh, 50,000. Dollars? In silver. You know. You did it wrong. Fuck. <laughs> 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 but of course, book burning is also symbolic. In ancient times, libraries were often second in size only to the palace and maybe some cathedrals. Hey man, everybody likes a big fire. Yeah. I, I, uh, there's every, better every, things every, to burn. Everybody likes big fires. No, I mean, from saying. back then, I mean, everyone was, was always... Was there better shit to burn back then? What else People. could they... That's everyone not, was always on ethnic purges. It doesn't go off the same way. Wow, okay, wow. Get, it getting dark. Getting I'm dark. I'm just saying. Don't, don't like burn, it. Don't burn the history. Just burn the people. Just saying. That is the... Fuck you. Go on. <laughs> if if a town happened to be under siege, torching the library was often a symbol of the city's helplessness. It was like a representation of your city taking a shot to the brain. All your town's knowledge is gone. The Library of Alexandria is perhaps the most famous of all these. The library was built sometime around 300 BC and sat on the docks of Alexandria, Egypt. Now, Alexandria was a huge central hub for both the Mediterranean as well as Middle Eastern territories. It was a rule that any ship that docked in Alexandria had to hand over any documents on their ship for copying by the library scribes. So this place was stacked with not only books and scrolls, but receipts, contracts, blueprints, literally anything that was written down. Oh, fuck that job. <laughs> God damn. Like, I, I, I mean, you might have been seen as, like detrimental as like a doctor though like i mean look he's just gonna fill your wounds with dirt i'm here to write shit down like i'm a copyist and it's the only way that people are getting their documents around on time the mail never stops <laughs> yeah <laughs> they were basically trying to collect all of the ancient world's knowledge and put it under one roof but like the dictators before him king ptolemy the eighth kicked out the scholars of the city of alexandria to legitimize his rule People who uh, people were still allowed to go in and check out the wealth of information that was in the library, but it basically became abandoned to anyone except students. When the battle for the control of Rome was in full force against Julius Caesar in 48 BC, he found himself stuck in the city of Alexandria. King Ptolemy IX had ships blocking his rescue from the water. So Caesar's men had a brilliant idea to unblock the way, set fire to the docks. They're thinking was that the floating wreckage, while it was on fire, would spread across the water to the blockade, and then Caesar's ships could come get him, you know? And this surprisingly did work a little bit. 
But what ended up happening was that the fire spread from the docks to the Library of Alexandria, which, if you'll remember, was also on the docks. Now the library's to, uh, the the library's actual destruction though has been grossly romanticized. People know about the burning of the Library of Alexandria as this great wealth of knowledge destroyed as a cost of war. But in reality, it seems like the fire that broke out was actually relatively small. Or more likely, it didn't even hit the main building at all, but instead a small warehouse right next to it, where they moved some shit that probably didn't really matter. Like, that's where the receipt warehouse was. Mm. And somebody's collection of a folder marked homework. Mm. And there is there is actually some proof to this. We have record of famous philosophers and playwrights of the day talking about visiting the library in the years following its supposed destruction. If the fire ever did hit the main building, they rebuilt what got wrecked pretty quick. The real reason for the library's destruction is probably from a couple of other fires that broke out through the years of 270 to 300 AD from whoever was conquering the city that day and just wanted to burn it down as a symbolic gesture. For funsies. Pretty much. Everybody likes a big fire. Yeah, but I mean, here's the thing. At this point, the Library of Alexandria had been attacked so many times that there were now several libraries throughout the city, so it was kind of a moot point. Like, city planners probably knew better than to keep something important in the Library of Alexandria for too long. Regardless, we know that we've lost an untold number of scientific and literary works from these attacks, but the truth is that we've probably lost more of an untold number of receipts as well. And while that doesn't seem like a big loss, it probably would have told us more about ancient civilizations than we could ever guess. So it's still something to mourn from an anthropological standpoint, at least. I mean, what if the fucking like documents that were like, like receipts for the pyramids or something were like in there? Or receipts for the pyramids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we know that they like they did get um, fucking contractors to work on it. Like we've got some documented proof of that, but shit just didn't survive that long. And it's like that's probably where it all was was in the library. They're just info. like they're like, oh no, a bunch of dipshits. Years from now, we're gonna think aliens did this. No, that's that's just a white people thing because it must have been aliens. It couldn't have just been brown people figuring out how. <laughs> I know. I, I remember trying <laughs> like, to have that argument with somebody online, and they're like, "Oh, you're gonna try and turn this into a race thing." I'm like, like "It is a race thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> why? Why is it just that? Like, we don't. <laughs> whatever. It's a losing point. Anyway, <laughs> I, in 325 AD, not long after the Library of Alexandria's destruction, was the first council. Of Nicaea. Over the course of the couple hundred years since the advent of Christianity, there were a lot of loopholes and inconsistencies poked in the Bible that caused people to take Christianity in new directions. Go figure. Loopholes in the Bible? No. <laughs> but for the newly converted Emperor Constantine of Rome, uh, believed that there should be only one way for Christianity. His. He, um... He actually, so he was like the Christian emperor because he had a dream with Jesus with, and I know you love to hear about dreams, Fuck. <laughs> but he, I think he waved a banner that had the first um, two letters of his name in Latin on it. And so when he woke up, he's like, that's it. That was a dream from God. And so oh, Constantine's, okay. um, you'll see a symbol in like Rome everywhere. It's a P and an X behind it. Oh. And that's, oh, it didn't really matter if anybody believed him or not. Cause he could just. Because he could he just wanted. behead whoever he wanted. Okay, cool, cool. All right. <laughs> so I mean, it was honestly kind of nice of him to lie then, you know, to make uh, him yeah. feel like they had the option. Honestly, he was probably... What the fuck was that? That was weird, right? Wait, was that a noise in the kitchen? I think so. Okay, so what's weird is I saw the door open a little bit, too. <laughs> At first, I was like, oh, Buster's here. And then I was like, wait a second, Buster's not here. Okay, possible editing point there. Move along. I'm, I'm scared. Uh... So, to stop different branches of the religion from growing, Constantine gathered a collection of 1,800 priests, abbots, and clerics, and dropped them into the city of Nicaea to debate the various theological points. Like, your job is now to figure out where the inconsistencies in the Bible are and explain them away. This meeting was a very big deal. They even established Easter during this meeting. <laughs> I don't know what that fixed, but... <laughs> Fuck Easter. You don't like eggs? No, dude. It's the worst <laughs> fucking holiday. It's the worst out of all of them. Why? Because it's so lame. In what way? You get candy. Just bad candy and... Uh, bad candy. Okay, look, I'm not a cream egg guy myself. Bad eggs? Uh, well, eggs. Well, eggs go with chocolate very well. We all know this. You put a little chocolate syrup on your scrambled eggs, it's godly. It's good. <sighs> 
Well, <laughs> the biggest argument in the first Council of Nicaea was this. Is Jesus an extension of God, or was he merely the son of God? Like, if God were the Pillsbury Doughboy, did he create a new being by pinching off a piece of himself and forming a new being? Or did he create someone using entirely new bread and just give him a bit of his own spit? This is too big brain for me. I wrote it down in a way that I would understand, which was food. Well, the council unanimously agreed that Jesus and God are the same person. This idea would later form the modern day Catholic Church. Wait, you can do that? What? You can just get together with people and decide things about God? Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's what they did. Whoa. I mean, that's what the Vatican does. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. (laughs) Yeah. We can't do it. Uh, We'll probably be assassinated. Not a silly enough hat. (laughs) This is is a fucking trucker trucker hat from Spencer's. It's got a weed leaf on it. What's wrong with it? Maybe silly enough. (laughs) Taller. More embroidery. No, 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 no. Must be bejeweled. But there was one dissenter. Against this more phallic, <laughs> <laughs> one dissenter against this whole idea. This was a clergyman named Arius, who had the thought that since it is stated in the Bible that God has no beginning or end, but Jesus has not only a very famous beginning but also a very famous end, that God is stronger than Jesus. Like God could beat up Jesus, no problem. The resulting argument was so fucking heated that one guy named Nicholas Amira walked across the room and popped Arius in the fucking mouth. God can't beat him, Jesus! (laughs) (laughs) That guy who popped him in the mouth, he eventually became a saint. Not for that, but... (laughs) Arius was ejected from the council and got fucking exiled. Emperor Constantine... The guy who got popped in the mouth? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Emperor Constantine later made... Hey, he hit me! We're exiling you for being a little bitch. (laughs) You were not invited to my birthday party. (laughs) Emperor Constantine later made a law about Arius and his teachings. Quote, if any writing composed by Arius should be found, it should be handed over to the flames so that not only will the wickedness of his teaching be obliterated, but nothing will be left even to remind anyone of him. And I hereby make a public order that if someone should be discovered to have hidden a writing composed by Arius and not to have immediately brought it forward and destroyed it by fire, his penalty shall be death. Arius later died while in exile of a suspected poisoning about 10 years later. But his teachings live wait, on. Wait, was he on Team Jesus or Team God? Uh, he was on Team God. He was on Team God? Yeah, he was the one that was like, God's tougher than Jesus. And the others were just like, no, that's like God beating himself up. And he's like, no, it's not. I mean, Jesus is a dude, you know? All right. Well, his teachings live on in some Unitarian God, churches the lies of these to this day. People. Right? <laughs> wow. What do you get exiled for? Having a thought? <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, what do you do for work? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me tell you, he just gets popped in the mouth 20 minutes later. We argue about a book. <laughs> yeah, so his his teachings do get uh, taught in some Unitarian churches today, and his followers are unfortunately named Arians. Oh. But the biggest thing this argument in the First Council in Nicaea led to was something called the Nicaean Creed, which is still used today, and it's all just a pledge to not think of Jesus and God as two separate entities like Arius did. We believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that whole thing. They just put in there up front. Not two, one dude. It's very specific. Right? Now, as we all know, as the Catholic Church became more and more powerful, they tried to convert people through force. But when that didn't work, they tried to enforce it through law. In 1225, a French man named Nicholas Donin was excommunicated from his Jewish community by his rabbi named Yekiel. We don't know exactly what he did, but chances are it wasn't good if he's getting kicked out of his entire neighborhood. Well, 13 years later, Nicholas Donin has worked his way through noble families and eventually made his way before Pope Gregory IX, telling him that he looked through the Jewish book of law, the Talmud, and found 35 pieces of slander that go against both Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. Now remember, the Talmud is much older than the Bible. Judaism came first, so of course it has inconsistencies with a book that came much, much later. But regardless, Pope Gregory IX put forward an order that all copies of the Talmud were to be burned, and the group of door-to-door arsonists were to be led by none other than Nicholas Donin himself. However, they didn't come across much success. 
No one caught to having any copies of the Talmud around, so they just ended up burning very little. I mean, hmm. I mean, why are you going to cop to this one douchebag and like 20 guys? Like, got any copies of the Talmud around? No. Nope. <laughs> can I Can I see? No. <laughs> no, man. Get the fuck out of here. Like. <laughs> However, Nicholas Donan wasn't done with his crusade and continued his campaign for the next 15 years. At that point, the news of the heretical Talmud made its way to France, where King Louis IX held a bit more sway over his people since he was king. Instead of banishing the book outright, he set a literal court date for the people versus the Talmud in 1240. This may be the first case of a book going on trial. In defense of the book, King Louis had four rabbis argue in its favor. The main prosecutor in the case against the Talmud would be, of course, Nicholas Donan. Now, out of these four rabbis defending the Talmud, one of them was Yekiel, the rabbi who had kicked Nicholas out of his community all those years ago. <laughs> I feel like maybe it's just supposed to be like one big like fuck you to his community for kicking him out for whatever he did all those years ago. And it's just been a revenge scheme all the way since. There's no documentation on what he did. No. Was he a diddler? I, 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 he fucking maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, like, that's the thing is like there wasn't any documentation on it because he was just being the asshole of the neighborhood and they kicked him out. They didn't want him around anymore. So, like, I don't know. Why, why bother writing it down? Like, maybe they just didn't like him. It could be. Smells bad. <laughs> They're just really shitty to him for no <laughs> reason. <laughs> <laughs> See his lazy eye? That's God weird. Damn. The fucking club foot motherfucker. Get him out. <laughs> now, the court case was obviously just for show. King Louis was going to torch the Talmud either way. But Yekiel was allowed to give his defense. According to Nicholas Donan, there were Hebrew words within the Talmud that praise someone, but they're not the names for God. Who are these mysterious demigods? Could they be demons? Well, according to Yekiel, these words were actually just different words for the power and spirit of God. So these words didn't praise God directly, but his power, like it's still praising God. Another argument was that in the Talmud was the story of someone named Jesus, sent to hell and boiled in literal shit for all eternity. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> That's a mud mask. Welcome to Caleb Can't Read. <laughs> but according to Yekiel, before Jesus Christ came along, it was a fairly common name. Shit, we use his original name to this day. It's Joshua. But Jesus' fame kind of made it impossible to be named that ever again, you know? Kind of like how you can't name your kids Adolf anymore. God damn it, you know? It's, it's not good a good name. name. It's, it's, it's not, not a good, a good name, name to begin with. No, it's but not, there's a lot of loss. There's a, <laughs> it's know, not a loss. There's other bad names out there that are still getting called, you know, like, hey, Keith. Oh, but, you know, there wasn't ever like a Keith Hitler out there. <laughs> there might be. Mm. <laughs> Keith Hitler. <laughs> My name's Keith Hitler. <laughs> Drinking Mountain Dew is punch and drywall. <laughs> As Yekiel went on to put it another way, quote, not every Louis born in France is king. Oh, he's got him there. Singer. Yeah, move along, please. <laughs> Although Yekiel and the other priests did manage to sway some people in court towards their side, King Louis IX still declared the Talmud guilty. Oh my God, people get into this shit. Uh, right? What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> well, he had Ugh. to put it on trial. It would be cruel to torch it, you know, just for being king. <laughs> God, I'm sorry, this is just all very weird. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I hope you're seeing a pattern. Mm. And with a bit more force than what the Pope 15 years before was able to manage... On June 17th, 1244, with four years' worth of collecting Talmuds throughout the country, King Louis torched 24 carriage loads of the book, estimated to be between ten to 12,000 copies. This is before the printing press, mind you, so all these were written by hand. And popes and various kings throughout the next couple hundred years would continue this tradition of burning the Talmud, uh, until the inventing of the printing press in 1450. The speed at which one could print out Talmuds was just too much for the government officials to keep up with, so they just kind of gave up. Now, although the burning of the Library of Alexandria was kind of symbolic rather than truly destructive, it gained momentum as a legendary tragedy over the course of the next thousand years. And what it did was give a goal for invading armies on what to accomplish. Like, everyone thinks that it was fully destroyed, so everyone's like, yeah, and everyone remembers that. We're going to be those guys now. If someone was truly Bigger able... Bigger fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if someone was able to truly destroy a community source of knowledge, you could potentially send them back to the Stone Age. It's just, I don't know, just, you, just wish somebody tell them, like, hey, like, 
We can just make a big fire. You don't have to pretend <laughs> like there's a reason for you to want a I mean, big fire. It's okay. I just like, feel like, I don't know. It's like. We don't have anything else going on. Let's go make a big fire. It'll be I, fun. Like, we don't have out, to do all this other bullshit. Well, we're out of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, we have the story of the Grand Library of Baghdad, also called the House of Wisdom. The Grand Library was the cornerstone was the cornerstone of a translation movement happening between the Greek and Arabic communities, as they were right in the middle between the Middle East and the Mediterranean. They were kind of like the Google Translate of the day. Any knowledge that was being passed from one territory to the next would pass through the House of Wisdom. Like, can you imagine how fucking huge that was? Like, somebody that's, like, doing a bunch of experiments out in the Middle East and a dude who's thinking about spending the next 20 to 30 years of his life doing the same shit can just read the fucking results from 100 years ago that he wasn't able to do before. Like, that sped up progress exponentially. Well, on February 13th, 1258, the Mongols came and ruined everything just because they could for an entire week. For funsies. I was thinking about this, and I think the Mongols were kind of like Asian Vikings in a way. <laughs> like they would just come and fuck shit up and then just kind of like, <sighs> I'm bored, you know, <laughs> just sort of like right on to the next town. Anyway, once the Mongols made their way inside the house of wisdom, they tore apart any leather bound books they could make uh, so that they could uh, make them into shoes <laughs> and threw the pages into the river. They went, what the fuck is this shit? It's covered in shoe. <laughs> is this a sandwich with words? <laughs> they went through so many books. The water turned black from all the ink. The week, this week-long raid marked the end of the Islamic Golden Age, from which we had exponential jumps in mathematics and astrology. I mean, Baghdad had, Baghdad had an archaic version of indoor plumbing before the Mongols came, and they completely obliterated everything, like, down through the pipeline system. They don't even have indoor plumbing in Baghdad now. Like, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> but before its destruction, there was a scholar named Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, <laughs> yeah it was <laughs> who saw the early signs of the invasion and managed to move 400,000 manuscripts out of the house of wisdom before he was eventually caught and killed a similar thing actually happened during the 2003 Iraq invasion by the US Aliyah Muhammad Baker what? what? No. oh I'm sorry did I call that an invasion? a hostile for no wait a, um, what was the word for it? um a a war? I want to say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we called it a war. <laughs> yeah, that's it. There it is. Yeah, it was kind of, oh, uh, wouldn't it technically be a conflict? Kind of like the Vietnam conflict? A conflict, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's because we didn't lose a war. We've only lost the conflict. And just like Vietnam where we're picking off farmers and shit left and right, you know? <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> Aliyah Muhammad Baker was a librarian for the Al-Basara Central Library in Basara, Iraq. When Iraqi troops placed an anti-aircraft gun on the roof of the library, she knew she had to start smuggling books out. I mean, they had one of the oldest copies of the Quran in existence in this library. Well, Aliyah, with the hope of locals, scaled a seven-foot wall and started a chain of passing out manuscripts down the line like a, like a bunch of ants. Like a chain, if you will. Yeah, mm. uh, over the wall and into the dining room of the restaurant next door. They managed to save 30,000 books, an estimated 70% of the entire library's catalog. Sure enough, the library got bombed to shit just shortly after that because there's a big fucking anti-aircraft gun there's on top of it. a big fucking gun on there. <laughs> but the library was rebuilt the next year in 2004, and Aliyah Muhammad Baker was named chief librarian. She unfortunately passed away from COVID last year in 2021. One of the more popular instances of book burning... Part, partly because it had a cool name to it, was the Bonfire of the Vanities in 1497. A preacher named Girolamo Savonarola was assigned to the city of Florence. Nice. Because, <laughs> thank you. That mm -hmm. was a game. Girolamo. Uh, he was assigned to the city of Florence because he was a fantastic pain in the ass. Reading through this guy's Wikipedia page was pretty amusing because he was very into preaching revelations and it was just a complete thorn in everyone's balls. It's definitely the most exciting bit. It, it is, but I mean, it's it's literally getting a dude from the street who's just end days, you know, like, the end is near! And just, they're just like... Bro, bro. Yeah, and it's like, I, I understand your necessity to be here, but it's annoying as fuck. If the end of days is near, <laughs> I do not want to spend the rest of my time stressing out. Please go away. Like, I could see an official walking into the church and everyone's just like, you know, not getting up for communion. And he's like, why aren't you passing out the communion? And he's just like... 
What's the point? We're all dead hours away anyway. In his defense, it does say it in there. It's weird they're ignoring it. Like, in I'm well, they're not ignoring it. You just wouldn't talk about anything else. Yeah, but that part's a bummer. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, dude, this shit is crazy. <laughs> Take it out of the book if you don't want me to talk about it. This is wild. <laughs> Jesus will literally ride a horse that shoots swords from its mouth. That is cool. I think his name is like Truth and Justice this or something. This wasn't your like, favorite part of this fucking I, book? Like, <laughs> No, the best part is at the end. It's cool <laughs> as shit. Beast with seven heads, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> So anyway, the Vatican sent Girolamo to Florence to try and keep him out of the way. And it was here in the art capital of the world that he saw such sinful works like boobs and wieners. So, <laughs> Boobs and wieners. Yeah, they were everywhere and he was offended. So during the, the famous Carnival, celebrated throughout Italy every year, Girolamo would start a fire in the middle of the Piazza della Signora, where he would torch anything that might tempt one to sin. Not just the paintings, but mirrors, makeup, playing cards, uh, fancy dresses, paintings, and yes, of course, books. This guy sucks. Uh, right? <laughs> See, now you're getting it. That's yeah. probably why they hired him at first. Like, hey, he's a gas to have around. All of a sudden, like, they're just smoking fucking, you know, they're just smoking their cardamom, and he's just like, it's just being a real fucking bummer the whole time. <laughs> you need people like that around, and you're feeling bad at yourself. You can just look over and be like, oh, I'm all right. At least I'm not Frank, you yeah. know? <laughs> at least I'm not that motherfucker. That'd be lame. Well, Girolamo had kind of a good following going on in town. But after a couple of celebrations of the bonfire of the vanities, Pope Alexander VI got real fucking tired of the guy. So he excommunicated Girolamo, hung him on a cross, and set fire to the cross in the Piazza della Signora. <laughs> Same place. <laughs> this that guy he hated held... sex so much the Pope thought he was obnoxious. <laughs> Holy shit. Same place that he would hold his burnings every year. He's just like, I like that he had to excommunicate him first. They're like, are you seriously going to burn a fucking priest? And he's like, he's not one anymore. <laughs> he's just a guy. And no, sending fire no. guys is fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there is a process. <laughs> I mean, like, it's impressive. The guy was only about 45 years old. Like, he, he lived his life just to piss on everything. The Pope then told anyone uh, in possession of Girolamo's writings that they had three days to give them up or he'd kill them too. Which, remember, this is this is 1497. This is uh, 100-ish years before Dante comes along. The, the Popes are, are straight-up dictators at this point, so they can do that now. Can the Pope still kill people? Uh, secretly, yes. <laughs> okay. I'm sure he doesn't, but can he? Yeah, probably. I would think he would. Okay. I, I mean... The current Pope. Yeah. Oh, the current... Well, Definitely the old Pope, the one that looked like Emperor Palpatine. Oh, yeah. You know, it's so weird to have just a Pope retired, you know? Is he alive? Yeah, he's alive. He looked like he was about to die when he was Pope. They always look that way, Caleb. They're all fucking 98. <laughs> we haven't gotten a young Pope in, like forever <laughs> like uh, yeah, yeah. i think the first pope was one of uh jesus's disciples supposedly so like that guy was youngish that was about it is not that old is it catholicism yeah yeah really? what are you talking i thought it was like a oh, i don't know i don't know well, anything about this shit i'm sorry i know yeah no i'm just impressed sometimes you know yeah it's yeah. like it's impressive it's not really like a it's a no, disc. no, no, no i'm just imp i'm very impressed no the word you're looking for is surprised um, no, it's, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm very oh. impressed. Okay. Like, right. wow. That's impressive. Shut up and drink your 40. <laughs> I'm gonna. Is it flat? No, it's okay. Especially when I shake it up like this. Dude, you can't no, do. it's not flat You can't anymore. do. You can't do old, old English. It has to, like. <laughs> it's like 12 hours old. You open that 40, you're committing to a blackout. I know. Okay? I know. Like, you need to finish it. You need to get it done. That's right? my it's fault. It's just going to be worse later. I know. Now, I've drank many a fucking warm 40 sitting out all night with, you know, fruit flies in it, but. I put it back in the fridge. I mean, it's okay. There's still some um, cupcakes in there, though, so it got a little bit of the vanilla taste to it. It's nice. Mm. <laughs> Anyway, I'm, sorry. I use my wine sorry, stoppers everybody. mostly for old forties than I do for anything it's not else. Help. It does. It, it helps keep it in the fizzle. Well, unfortunately, not every book burning can be as funny as um, setting that guy on fire. Bishop Diego de Landa. This guy was very special. I may even do an episode on the codex he created some other day, because this is a long fucked up story. But basically. He was the bishop in charge of converting the people of the Yucatan Peninsula around the year 1549 for the Spaniards. When he heard that there were still some natives practicing their native Mayan religion, after all he'd done for them, 
he set out on a mission to destroy all of their devilish native history. And I mean, he really fucking succeeded at this, too. As he wrote, quote, We found a great number of books containing such letters, and as they did not contain an iota in which there was not superstition and falsehoods of the devil, we burned them all, which dismayed and distressed them greatly. End quote. Yeah, go fucking figure. <laughs> oh, sorry, I spaced out. What's oh, the, going on? He's burning all of their shit, and the people are dismayed and di- disoriented, and it's like, yes. He's like, burning all like, of the Mayan works. What, like, they didn't like the fire? It's super sweet! <laughs> I didn't know that they had fire. I thought it'd be cool. I thought I'd just show them. <laughs> the only way we're able to decipher some Mayan works today is because he managed to create a codex of translations made through torture methods called the Relacion de las Cosas de Yucatan. Uh, and unfortunately, yeah, you know that one. What does it mean in Spanish? Oh, fuck off. <laughs> and unfortunately, because Bishop de Landa was kind of a dipshit... He didn't really transcribe things correctly before destroying all traces of Mayan history. I'm not going to write the whole thing. That's yeah. ridiculous. So his book is the only thing we can go off of to translate the Mayan works that have since been found, but they don't make a whole lot of sense. However, Bishop de Landa did have a list of words. He just had a Mayan dude say in front of him, and he just wrote, wrote it all down, if that helps. Like, this guy would be able to just list every word in their lexicon. But Delanda did manage to get at least some of the basics onto paper, enough so that scholars were able to translate the last words of the Mayan, confirming the theory that he was tortured as he did so. The last words Bishop Delanda wrote down were, I don't want to. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Security chuckle. <laughs> that is horrifying. Oh, that's genuinely creepy. Right? No. Oh. <laughs> it's fucking terrifying. I feel less okay than I did before. <laughs> And I'm terrible to myself. You want that me to, to reread the something. part about the setting the guy on fire? <laughs> no, it's okay. That's good. Throughout history, book burnings would be done mostly in terms of war or religious ideals. But thanks to one man, he was able to bring book burning to the United States law. Anthony Comstock created the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice in 1873, something we touched on in both our episodes on James Joyce and I believe E.E. E. Cummings. E-Cummings. Now, this guy was not just against lewd works being circulated for publication. He was also, of course, a giant cuck. Anthony Comstock instituted the Comstock Laws, which would limit the usage of contraceptives in the United States, something that we're thankfully battling decades fucking later. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Now, in case... Yeah, well, you can thank people, him. <laughs> how is he going to keep people poor, man? I, <laughs> I mean, we need workers. <laughs> like... You don't oh, fucking no. I'm not. What fuck, you got? No, no fuck them. No. Okay. Now, in case you haven't listened to our uh, Joyce or Cummings episodes, <laughs> <laughs> or if you need a reminder, the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice were the guys that would find immoral literature. Oh yeah. Basically, anything not aligned with Christianity and burn them. Anything uh, that, or sorry, Anthony Comstock was estimated to be the cause of 4,000 arrests during his war on literature, and even bragged that he was the reason for 15 suicides. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a hell of a thing to bring up at a party. You know? <laughs> I have caused this much stress. <laughs> That's God damn, that's evil, though. Just yeah. fuck me. All over wieners. Yeah, no, he, he wore it like a badge of honor. In his career, Comstock destroyed enough books to weigh 15 tons and 284,000 pounds of printing plates. He was quoted as saying, quote, books are feeders for brothels. Quoted as saying, quote, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> books are feeders for brothels. Wait, did you just say that weird or did you write that down like that? I want to know how bad you No, I just there. said it weird. I didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, why didn't I put quote there beforehand? Oh, well, that's why. Yeah. Wait, books, what do you say again? Books are feeders for brothels. <laughs> like if you start reading, that's gonna start to get you into a. Well, you haven't read a whole lot, have you? That's yet. about You're the still... only thing I've ever heard that made a book sound cool. <laughs> you know what's this? What's this, Doctor Seuss, all about? God, I want to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I want to pay for sex. God, I'm lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. This red fish and the blue fish have both two fish and three fish to hang out with. I and got I'm no horny. <laughs> <laughs> fuck some fish. When Comstock died at the age of 71 in 1915... Oh, the window's open, maybe not. Yeah, 
Oh no, fuck him. It's just a it's just a bunch of apartments back there. Who cares? It's, oh, don't worry, Caleb. It's just a lot of people. It's just a lot of children. Oh. oh. When he died at the age of seventy one in nineteen fifteen, it was said that he had a very large collection of pornography. Who would have guessed? Dude, that happens every time. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know why he's flipping out about sex? Because he's thinking about it all the time. Same reason politicians flip out about gay that's people. Because they're his... thinking about men fucking all the time. What are you talking about? That's just his evidence locker. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, oh my God. Yeah, I know. It's like, it's, there's always that whole thing of like, you know, everyone's everyone's uh, like against, you know, like... What you got? Come on, come on, baby boy. No, it's just like it's it's just these politicians who are just like, you know, like we gotta we gotta break down on on the gays and you know the and the pedophiles is that and it's thing like, still. Oh yeah, I'm not sure it is. Are but... you kidding me? Oh, it and it always comes up too. They are always like hundred percent of the time. They are always pedophiles. So yeah, it's because <laughs> dude, you know how many times? Like, how often in the day do you think about men fucking each other? I, not not often. It enough. doesn't happen, right? <laughs> For those guys, if they're making a career about it, they're clearly thinking about fucking men a bunch. If they're thinking of passing legislation to stop it, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, to be honest, I don't think about sex all that much. I mean, it, it would be the same thing for anybody else. Like if those yeah, thoughts I mean, are did, intruding I, 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 in your mind, it's like just accept them and move on. If it's not in, if it's not what you're into say see you later and switch it to a woman's face i don't know just go blast one of the toilet real quick and move on with your day you've never blown a woman's cock it's great you know is it <laughs> yeah huh i mean you don't see them in the glory hole but i'm assuming i was no blowing a no woman. hey you that's the point of the glory hole this joke has been made a million times i'm not going there but you don't know okay so it could be anybody that's right yeah wait was it you at the macy's on thursday Shut the fuck up. It's not funny. We're going to edit that out. It's not a good joke. Don't like We're it. We're not. I'm uploading it directly because I don't want to work. <sighs> and as much as I Fat didn't fuck. as much as I didn't write down every instance of book burning throughout history, you'll just have to take my word that the list is very long and more often than not, it seemed to involve controlling the Jewish population in some manner. For instance, in 1891, German psychologist Ewan Block uh, commissioned a 10-year study to understand the effects of the Jewish population on Russia. Don't ask <laughs> why. I don't know. Every fucking time, <laughs> like just throughout history, it's always like, we need to blame someone. Let's bring out all reliable. Yeah, that's really what it is. And it's like, it, it still is today. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah. But either way, his study came in the form of a four volume set, four fucking books to document how Jews are in Russia. <laughs> Concluding. That the Jews in Russia surprisingly benefited their economy because, you know, they're people and people buy uh, things th 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 to help here. stimulate the economy. What? You are treading on dangerous ground. Well, in what way? Don't make me explain this to you. What? Okay, no, keep going. All right. All I'm saying is his volume concluded that they're people who buy things, therefore stimulating the economy. Well, Russia was on and is still on a pretty big anti-Semitic kick, so they banned Ewan Block's work in Russia and burned what they could find. They didn't want to getting out there that they were helping anything. Write a book about <laughs> Jews. Not like that. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually heard Ewan Block's name on this podcast once before. He was the first guy to publish the Marquis de Sade's 120 Days of Sodom a few years after this incident in 1904. Okay, so not exactly a, you know, He's done good and bad. <laughs> Now, during the fascist regime of Francisco Franco in Spain between 1939 and 1975, Franco waged a familiar war against knowledge in Spain. Quite famously, his troops would burn the library of Pampu Fabra, the creator of the Catalan language we have today. While they did so, they would shout, Abajo la inteligencia! Or in English. <laughs> <laughs> Down with the intellectuals. There's no better fucking motto that you can have with that. <laughs> Just like, hey, um, I know that we've been following him around a bit, Franco. Um, and uh, and Fuck I just you, feel like, college boy. <laughs> I feel like, uh, I, do you appreciate us? Oh, I absolutely appreciate you. Yeah. Now go say down with smart people and <laughs> start shooting up <laughs> families. Like <laughs> on sort of the same page, perhaps most famously. On April God, 8th. shit's always sucked, hasn't it? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. This is a history podcast. Right. <laughs> on sort of the same page, perhaps most famously, on April 8th, 1933, the Nazis declared action against the un-German spirit. 
The books that were burned seemed almost random. They burned Franz Kafka. They burned uh, Eric Remarque. They burned Hermann Hesse. Among the list of banned authors was Jewish poet Heinrich Heine, <laughs> who wrote in 1822, quote, where they burn books, they will, in the end, burn human beings too. Yeah. Although their initial selection of works to be destroyed seemed a bit haphazard at first, the Nazis quickly got a hang of where their anger should be centered. That same day, the Nazis cleared out the Institute of Sex Research, a literal institute dedicated on the science of sex. The Nazis managed to clear out the entire catalog within the Institute of anywhere between 12 to uh, 20,000 books, uh, which were hauled onto the street and burned. It's also believed that Dora Richter, the first person to undergo gender reassignment surgery, was killed in this attack as well. As horrific as this day was, not even a week later, there was a bonfire against un-German literature in nearly every college town, with Joseph Goebbels, the minister of propaganda, addressing over the radio, no to decadence and moral corruption. I hope you're starting to see a theme here. Mm Mm-hmm. A year later, the authors exiled from Germany for their un-German sentiment came together in France to create the Library of the Burned Books. Oh, good. They were safe there, right? In France? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Nothing bad ever happened. Great. Where all the titles that were now forbidden in Germany were gathered together in one place. Of course, when... Oh. Shock. Oh, fuck. I I can't believe you got to hear this, but when, when France was eventually taken over by the Nazis years later... The library was closed down. But it wasn't burned. Or did they burn it later? It's an entire library filled with the books that they banned and burned. Oh, they did. It's called the Library of the Burned Books. You said (laughs) closed down. Okay. Don't act surprised when I think it just closed down if that's what you said. It is called the Library of the Burned Books, and those books were very much unburned. (laughs) They had to fix it. But in the same year that the Library of the Burned Books was established in 1934, America also made their response to the Nazi book burnings by creating the American Library of Nazi Banned Books, opening at, where else, the Brooklyn Jewish Center. (laughs) The library remained open until the 1970s. Wait, why did it close in the 1970s? I just um, couldn't. It's because it was New York in the 70s and shit got really, really poor. Oh, okay. (laughs) But the banning of certain books and authors was just the beginning for them. The Nazis' real goal when it came to uh, book burning on a more massive scale was the complete cultural erasure of the Polish people. In 1944, the Nazis marched through Warsaw and uh, destroyed the Krasinski Library, the large personal library of the Zamoyski family, and the central archives of historical records. The Krasinski Library housed 150,000 pieces of literature dating back several hundred years. You can actually see the remains of the old Krasinski Library on display in the newly built Krasinski Library. The ashes of the old library fit inside a single fucking urn. In 1945, the Nazis continued their raising of Warsaw by destroying the public library and the Krasinski Library, both of which held historic works. While the complete erasure of Poland clearly didn't happen because it's a stupid fucking goal, there are numerous works that have forever been lost due to this. And I'd like to remind people that just because these works are ones that you'd probably never heard of, there's a good fucking chance that at least one mundane work from any one of these libraries could have inspired someone to create something incredible. But now that avenue of creativity is lost. And worse yet, because these dipshits torch the central archives of historical records, a lot of people in Poland can't trace their lineage back further than 1944. Now, during the Cold War, many countries sharing a border with, Ru- with Russia found themselves bullied by the communist superpower. As a matter of fact, the term is today called Finlandization because Finland was particularly weak in moral standards against their neighboring tyrant. Case in point, Jero Leino. By the way, this name is hard as fuck. For me to pronounce in its native finished. I, I looked it up to try and do like a phonetic thing, but my mouth cannot make those sounds. Yeah, no, no, no. The further north you go, the goofier the whiteys get. It sounds like a fish bubble. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> try, again. try again. <laughs> Yo. Oh, man. How wacky. So anyway, Yerho was Minister of the Interior to Finland between the years of 1946 to 1948, where he was the communist figurehead for his country. But after his dismissal, Yero went quietly away from the public eye. Until 10 years later, 
in 1958 when Yero came out with his memoirs about his time as the Minister of the Interior in Finland. Now, this book was prepared and printed in secret because Yero knew the Russians would try to stop it from coming out. And sure enough, whatever was in it, the Soviets did not want it to get out. So Russia told the Finnish government that if this book was printed, there would be some, quote, serious conclusions. Well, in the first ever instance of Finland's self-censorship, all 12,500 copies of the book were burned, with the exception of a few that were snuck out of the pile to political rivals. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Yuro Leno's memoirs were finally released. Turns out there wasn't anything that big of a deal in it. The Russians were just really scared that there was. Like, I would figure that they would have probably grabbed a, a copy and like been like, let's see it first. But they were also just probably trying to flex real fucking Well, I mean, hard. also, like, if they've put that much effort in at that point, then it's going to be really embarrassing if anybody finds it and then, you know. It actually seems like less effort to just burn all the books, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They're just like, what's in it? I don't care. Torch it. <laughs> burn the books. Sick for them. Let's go. Penguin Books was first established by brothers Alan, Richard, and John Lane in 1935. They were men who were tired of the bookshops at train stations having nothing good to read. And since then... Penguin Books has become a powerhouse publisher, but in the 1960s, they nearly had to close their doors. In 1960, they were part of a large class action lawsuit due to the UK's very own Obscene Publications Act of 1959. Penguin had decided to publish D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover against the wishes of mothers everywhere, particularly <laughs> for its use of four-letter words. And although Penguin My Books... Dick. <laughs> pr- but... <laughs> And uh, puss, but not with the Y, because that makes it five letters. <laughs> and although Penguin Books did end poop, they <gasps> dude, all the fun words are four letters. I know. <laughs> <laughs> poop balls. Stop it. No. <laughs> After the, <laughs> although Penguin Books did end up winning the trial and the publicity made the book a runaway hit, the trial still took them down a peg financially and caused a mutiny at Penguin headquarters. After the trial had ended, it was clear that chairman of the company and founder Alan Lane had been in a slow mental decline, and the board of directors wanted him out. When they tried to force him out, though, he stole copies of an art book called Massacre by the artist known as Cine that were at the publishing house waiting to be sent out to bookstores everywhere. Lane saw the drawings as crass and lewd, and fearing another lawsuit, snuck into the warehouse at night, loaded up the copies of Sina's work, and burned the books on his farm. He was promptly let go after that. Yeah. The book, Sina's Massacre, is now pretty rare and usually sells for around 200 bucks. It's also, it's really funny shit. I, I don't know what the, the problem was. <laughs> like, I just saw two of the uh, drawings. One of them is like a dude on a bed of <laughs> nails, but the nails are all dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Nice. And the other is like a dude doing that like flute thing. Oh, dude. Like, dude, 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 dude. Okay, 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 okay. Pause, pause. We're looking this shit up. We're looking this shit up right now. Wait, like skin flute? Is that what you're going no, with that? No, 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 no. Is, is the flute a dick? No. It's, oh, I, God. To me, it's better. Doodle doodle doodle. Here, scroll left. Oh, nice. The other one is uh, is a woman with a flute to like raise like, a snake. Like but charming it's, the di- Yeah, but it's charming dick. the penis. Yeah. <laughs> it's good shit. <laughs> I mean, I like, guess I was. I don't know. I, I think it's pretty funny though. I'm a little. De- I'm a little depressed about the comic style. It looks a bit boomerish. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, this was 1960. I was really excited for this. This was like 1965 that and happened. I've been let down. No, it was good. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty. I mean, it's funny, but I, I did look through some of his other shit. You got any more? There, or just these two. Uh, just those two that are Aww. on Wikipedia. But if you look up his stuff, it, it's it gets pretty sacrilegious and shit. But it's kind of funny, you know. Like like um, there's a nun dressing, and uh, Jesus is on the cross with like a pair of binoculars, like watching her, <laughs> <laughs> or like he's yelling at a woodpecker to stop, <laughs> like nailing at the cross. He's like, stop, 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 <laughs> like stop it, know. stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Now, when Indian-born British author Salman Rushdie announced his forthcoming fourth novel called The Satanic Verses in 1988, he was met with a little opposition. The novel itself is kind of a fantasy love story, but it is inspired by the story of Muhammad. Now, before the novel was even released, it was met with heavy criticism from the Islamic crowd. 
And of course, none of them had even read it. So even when it turned out to just be a regular ass novel, Rushdie was still getting threats. Before the book was even released, it was banned in Iran, India, Sudan, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Thailand, Tanzania, Indonesia, Singapore, Venezuela, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Oh, do better, Bangladesh. Listeners. Do better, Bangladesh. <laughs> the Ayatollah in Iran himself even issued a fatwa against Rushdie, placing a $2 million bounty on his head. And while the fatwa has today been lifted, the bounty is still there, which has since been up to $3.3 million. Uh, adjusted for inflation. Uh, yeah, pretty much, yes. yeah. <laughs> 75 bucks. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Bookstores around the world were firebombed if they held on to the satanic verses and multiple assassination <laughs> attempts. Jesus. I know. And here's the thing. It's just a love story. That's all that is. And I think that they were like, all right, uh, hey, that title's pretty spicy. Uh, right. Well, here's the thing. The satanic verses is a, a portion of the Quran. Like it's, it's a, basically he named it after a chapter and it, like, <laughs> I don't think that Wait, is that it, why they're pissed. It wasn't like a Satan thing. No, it was, it was, just a, mad it, that was it was a chapter in the, Quran? he was, he was basically uh, like he had like all character names are different and everything, but it's very obviously one character is based on Muhammad and they didn't like that. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, not touching that. Okay. Yeah. That, no, no, let's, let's move on. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there have been several attempts on Salman Rushdie's uh, life since 1988. The first was on August 3rd, 1989, when Mustafa Mahmoud Maze, which is just a pseudonym, by the way, not his real name, was making a bomb within a book in his hotel room in central London. His plan to give the book to Salman Rushdie to sign and then blow him to smithereens. But the bomb went off prematurely, still in Mustafa's hotel room, thereby collapsing two floors of the hotel. Oh, that's not funny at all. Yeah. Uh, there is, I, and, and here's the thing. I couldn't find out how many people Mustafa ended up killing besides himself. If Two any, floors worth. But fuck him sideways anyway. Like, I, I don't know. I, all that, everyone pretty much just like back then were writing articles about like, haha, suicide bomber or like just regular bomber, but he turned into a suicide bomber because he didn't mean to, isn't that funny? <laughs> and it's like, it's like, oh, entire families might've been killed. That's cool. Um, oh, for sure. There is actually now a shrine for Mustafa in Tehran that says, Martyred in London, 2nd August, 1989, the first martyr to die on a mission to kill Salman Rushdie. <laughs> like, he's not he's a martyr. Still alive, he's right? a dipshit. He is actually still alive. Uh, in 1990, a year after... the so stressful if you knew somebody built a statue about trying to kill you. <laughs> Fucking God, how does this man function? <laughs> Fairly well. Like, oh, God damn. Um, in 1990, a year after the release of the Satanic Verses... Salman Rushdie was portrayed in a Pakistani action film called International Gorillas as its main villain. Like, G U E Gorillas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. No, not, not the, I the mean, International Gorillas. Interesting. Would be pretty cool, too, actually. Still interesting, but not as rad. From the people who brought you Life of Pets. <laughs> His, uh, so he's the main villain in this movie. His evil plan was to open casinos and discos throughout the country, which would destroy the morality of the Pakistani people. In the movie... Rushdie tortures his victims by having them listen to an audiobook of the Satanic Verses. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> it's pretty weak. <laughs> well, it's okay, because he's eventually killed by three giant Korans that appear in the sky and shoot him with lightning bolts. They can do that? <laughs> hey, 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 we are back on dangerous ground, and we are moving on. Quiet, Cable. Caleb, there's... Don't. I, I have one on the shelf don't, over there. Don't you do need it. To be careful. Do not do this. Be careful. Uh uh. Be careful. Nope. Not. <laughs> nope. This is all you, motherfucker. No. Hell no. <laughs> and Salman has been constantly threatened for the last 35 years over this fucking book. Watching you. He says he still gets a death threat from the Pakistani government every Valentine's Day, which is nice. Um, but regardless of the threats, he was still knighted in 2007 because he's a good fucking writer. So take that, I guess. <laughs> I still live in fear, but I'm a sir now. Similarly to Salman Rushdie's story, in 1995, a novel was published in Iran by someone writing under the pseudonym Riza Koshnazar. The book was called The God's Laugh on Mondays and is about our main character, a male student, getting raped by his classmate, but he can't tell if he was into it or not. The emotional turmoil within himself eventually leads to the main character going on a murder rampage and then committing suicide. Oh, 
Yeah, boy, that was a rough two sentences. Yeah. Anyway, I think the whole purpose of this book was probably just to turn heads within the Iran community, which it did. On the night of August 22nd, 1995, a group of men pretending to be building inspectors burned down the publishing house that printed the book. Fucking vests, man. High vis vests. <laughs> right. They carried a ladder in here, I assumed, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, in newspapers, the vigilantes were praised, while Riza Kushnazar was likened to Salman Rushdie, which I think is a little insulting on Salman Rushdie's part. <laughs> like, guy's an actual novelist, and this guy who's just like, and he goes on a rampage, he starts shooting everyone, he shot off this man's balls. Like, uh, not quite similar. Well, either way, Reza made his way to Sweden, where he has since produced six more novels, unharassed. One of the books is called My Red Ass Baboons. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there because um, he's an artist like Salman Rushdie. Are we moving on from that? I don't want to move on from that. <laughs> he was knighted. No. Red ass baboons. And like... <laughs> I couldn't find out what it's about, and this I don't sounds really care amazing. <laughs> now, Terry Jones is a well-known racist pastor from Missouri. You make bad decisions sometimes. <laughs> he has since relocated to Florida because why wouldn't he? He founded the Dove World Outreach Center in Gainesville, which has spread homophobic hate since day one. Oh. Terry announced in 2010 that he would burn a Quran in remembrance of 9-11 for his first annual Burn a Quran Day. The then-President Obama said this could possibly endanger the lives of troops abroad. Local Muslims said it would be better to make September 11th a Love Jesus Day, an about of religious solidarity instead of hatred, since both Christians and Muslims follow the teachings of Christ. Other people said maybe it would be better if more Americans actually read the Quran to inspire a bit of cultural understanding for people in the Eastern world. Like, not to convert anyone, but inspire a bit of cultural understanding for people you're supposed to hate. Maybe understanding them is the first step in accepting them. I mean, yeah, this is really trashy, but I mean, you you, you have sent them to war. They are getting shot at. It's not going to make it more dangerous. Yeah. Well, well, actually, so Terry Jones... Like, uh, are they going to try to kill them harder? Like, what do you... Uh, they did. Well, Terry oh. Jones actually pussed out when he said he'd burn the Quran, but he did do it uh, on March 20th, 2011, about six months later. Mm. This sparked a riot in Afghanistan that ran into U.N. mission centers. This and is at very least, drunk behavior. At least 14 people were killed and beheaded. We can smell our own. <laughs> I think alcohol's outlawed there. Oh. <laughs> no, this is just religious fanaticism. Okay. And would you look at that? All of a sudden, there was a spike in Al-Qaeda recruitment, too. Because Terry Jones is a fucking moron. Oh, that's why it would make it more dangerous. I wouldn't use it very often, but this man is literally retarding progress. He did it all in one go. You're really pleased that you found a reason to use that, right? He's retarded. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> And this, of course, started a trend among more armchair tough guys who started following suit, which is great that they can burn Korans all day long on YouTube as it as it means as long as it means that people in their neighborhood aren't facing the repercussions. Is this the incident that inspired this episode? Uh, No, actually. Oh, we're getting to it. Yeah. Next one. But, you know, I mean, that's it's it's truly maddening that these people think that they're really on like equal grounds about fighting uh, an intellectual war with people in the Middle East by just setting shit on fire at home where they're safe. Why do do conservatives do that? They like do it with like brands and shit like it matters. Oh, because it's just tough guy attitude. Like in, in in a real fight, they would probably drop fairly easily because who wouldn't? Because you're still a person. Like why, you know, and all people drop easily. Why would you burning your Nikes mean anything? Um, Like, are you, do you have some kind of emotional, cultural attachment to your fucking Nike? Like, what the fuck is going on? Once they're counting up the receipts, they're like, oh shit, John Smith said that he was going to burn this. (sighs) We should really commemorate this next $100 to the, to the GOP fund. We should really do that. (laughs) And finally, we come to this year in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. On February 2nd, 2022. Pastor Greg Locke from the Global Vision Bible Church live-streamed on Facebook his book-burning event. On Instagram, he claimed that it was his followers' biblical right to destroy anything tied to the Masonic Lodge, which I think probably was just inset for Jews, probably, because why wouldn't he? Their books of choice were the Harry Potter books and Twilight. (laughs) Now, here's something that I don't think these idiots understand. Not everything that's grounded in fantasy is anti-Christian. Twilight is written by a Mormon and has 
all Mormon values in the book. That's the only reason that the main characters don't fuck before marriage, because they're Mormon. And while I haven't heard of anything bad about Stephanie Meyer, fucking J.K. Rowling, seriously? Just remember, kids, it's way less weird to really <laughs> want to fuck each other for a long time <laughs> for some reason. Well, it, as much as Rowling tweeted about how much she hated Trump, she's still a fucking turf. Like, there are plenty of right-wingers that hated Trump, but damn near all of them share a hate for the LGBTQ community. I really don't think that they realize J.K. Rowling is one of them. Like, all that they have to do is a little research and be like, oh, she's all right. No, 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 hang on, hang on. <laughs> we went over this earlier. Magic is scary, okay? <laughs> there's my, there's magic in the Bible. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, but that's Bible magic. That's safe. That's a safe zone. All right? That's that's fine. Magic it starts are... with... <laughs> shh, shh, shh. It's not magic. That's ma Magic is weird shit that doesn't involve God. That's magic. If it involves God, it's just fucking God. Uh, right? Those are the rules. Th they appear to be the rules. So... Jesus' story, his birth, it didn't start with a magical rape of a teenager, but no. it started with a miracle rape of a teenager. Exactly. Okay, good. I'm happy. <laughs> I mean, do you, I mean, I feel like that's a pretty good explanation. That's the rules, right? Like, if it's. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God gave me gonorrhea. I don't know where that came from that at all. That is a miracle. So, yeah. But you know what? This whole thing that Greg Locke is even doing is just to drum up numbers like this idea to burn Harry Potter and Twilight books wasn't even his. Greg took it straight from a pastor in Poland that did the exact same thing three years ago. Wait, so did you identify that this guy was just trying to get attention and then talk to him, talk about him on your podcast? Uh, what? Like. Oh, well. <laughs> you fucking idiot. I, what would it have changed? You know what? I don't like, know. I mean, yeah, it's not a popular podcast, like, Jordan, but still, like, the irony is a little... I guess so. But you know what? I mean, fuck Greg. That was the... You know? We've been doing that the whole time? <laughs> I gave I gave Greg a, an hour-long podium, yep. No, Greg doesn't believe in any of this shit. He's just here to take people's money anyway. Yeah. Do better, Greg. Yeah, it's America, you baby. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I mean, I looked back on, like, old shit that he was pissy about, too, and it's always shit to just try and get into the media. Like the dude doesn't believe in anything. Of course not. He's just taking people's money. I it's it's a it's a good idea to grift people in churches, but few of us have the moral standard to do it. Like the more low, of us the low moral standard. Yeah, more do. of us are better people than that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I can't do that. That's that's punching down, you know? <laughs> Wait. What? You think we could do that? Absolutely. 100%. It is so easy to take people's money if you put God in the title. It's very easy. Why haven't we discussed this before and why because are we still going to work? Because it's shitty. It's a shitty idea. That's the only thing. Everyone's had this idea. It's just that it's a shitty thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> it's also probably very easy to knock over a convenience store that's not tied to a major chain that's off of 23rd and Bond, but you know what? It it's shitty. I mean, I guess, but I mean... <laughs> All right. Yeah, As a final yeah, yeah. note... I'd just like to give a shout out to the guy who showed up to Greg's book burning event with a copy of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 and Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species, but threw a copy of the Bible into the fire instead. He got pretty aggressively walked off the property while yelling, Hail Satan! And while everyone was watching him, he, ballsy. he kissed his boyfriend, too. <laughs> so, good on you, guys. Right, back off, fuck off, I'll suck your dick! <laughs> My sources today... Wikipedia and book burning counter protest Mount Juliet, Tennessee, February tw uh, 2nd, 2022 by Chris Harden on YouTube.com. Yeah, the the whole movement of book burning. I mean, it's just fucking gimmicks left and right. I mean, especially once the printing press got put out there, you think that like you're ever going to like well, I mean, get rid of a fucking book? Well, I mean, it's, it's stupid, especially <laughs> now that not everything is like written down by scribes or whatever. It's kind of yeah. like, what's the what, what do you yeah, what's what's the fucking point of it? You're, like really you're uh, well, okay once so, again big fire well so here's the here's the whole thing though is a lot of these people are stealing copies of harry potter and twilight from school libraries and shit <laughs> thinking that that's going to do anything I'm just picturing like some 40 year old fucking right-wing weirdo dude getting caught stealing twilight from the library and explaining <laughs> that like <laughs> it's to it's to burn it no, i'm so, burning it i'm burning oh god <laughs> it just bends down to pick it up off the ground and he's wearing pink fucking whale tail back there like just thinking of like <laughs> cops catching him, bringing him in, putting him in an interrogation room, and fucking with him, and being like, "So, <laughs> so, uh, Team great. Edward or Jacob, come clean." <laughs> like, no, god damn it! <laughs> like, so I guess I'm I'm in here for grand larceny. Is that it? 
No, uh, we've got a very specific thing that we're putting on your record. <laughs> <laughs> it stole a copy of Twilight, says it isn't his. <laughs> <laughs> Said he read it for the articles. No, he, uh, I, I mean, here's the thing, though, is like these people pretend to give a shit about like their children's education. And it, let's say that they believe in magic. That That's fine. It's insane, but it's still fine. If you're worried about your child believing in magic and shit, then you got to believe in real world repercussions. I mean, if. They're not stealing copies of Mein Kampf okay. and burning those. <laughs> like, Dude, remember, if, if they're, like, speaking of punching down, if they're at the evangelical Christian level, mm -hmm. then do you really think believing in magic, apart from what they're already believing in their religion, is that much of a fucking jump? No, I, I, and I think that's fine. I think that's fine. But here's the thing. If you think that Harry Potter is super evil... Why would you bother burning them? Because they're probably just going to magically reappear in the warehouse anyway. J.K. Rowling is a seasoned wizard. Like, <laughs> I mean, this is stupid. Some might this say, is dumb as shit. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, man. It's just, and, and I've seen people doing it with like whatever Trump book comes out where they start burning those two in a much smaller circle because people are just like, this is dumb. Hey. But like, <laughs> what? Fire. <laughs> Again, there's better shit to burn. I mean, I did know I did know one guy that f uh, pulled out the 420th page out of a Bible to roll a fucking blunt on 420 because he was a high schooler, and um, so I mean that's a teenager, and that's more of a magical ritual. You know what you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like it's, it's not purely symbolic. For the, it's symbolic, exactly. Yeah. Um, do better though. Do better, Bangladesh. You know, don't burn shit. <laughs>